introduce to you all in the Lord's name. It's lovely for us both to be back here with you in Evington. Back in September 1999, I was one of the preachers at the Air Convention in Scotland. It was during the longish period when we were living and ministering in York. And so I went by train, York to Air, changing at Glasgow. Arrived at the York platform in good time. I have a reputation in my family that I'm so anxious not to miss the train. I'm more likely to be there in time for the previous one. But on this occasion, I waited for my train and it was already late. I think it was uh, one from London signalling trouble at Peterborough or something like that. Eventually it rolled in and on I got, conscious that there was a certain tightness to time in order to get to my hosts in air, have something to eat, get changed and be ready for the convention ministry at half past seven. Ever hopeful that as we went north from York to Glasgow, we'd gather time. But we didn't. We lost time. And one thing after another went wrong. I shan't stay to tell you, it was such a catalogue, I've half forgotten it. Suffice it to say that we were due in Glasgow, Queen Street or Central, I think it was Queen Street, we were due in Glasgow at something like 3.17. And we finally choked in at half past six. So there we were. This afternoon, dear friends, on the 25th of September, 2021, I bring you the late arrival of the train due in here, so to speak, on the 21st of March, 2020. But here we are, having in the meantime, to God's praise, been kept by the power of God. And so, without further ado, off we go. Now, friends, the Emmaus Road. What do you think of when you hear those words? Do you think of the resurrection day of the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes, quite right. Do you think of the risen Jesus' appearance to two of his disciples as they were walking the seven-mile or so journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus? On that day? Yes, indeed. Right once more. Do you think of, from the narrative that we've just read, do you think of the clearly recorded facts that, that to begin with, as Jesus drew near to them on that walk, to begin with, uh, their eyes were kept from recognizing him. They didn't realize, amazingly, that it was him. It was as if their eyes were shut uh, to his identity. Until later on, when again, just as there'd been, we might say, the divine shutting of the eyes, there was the equally divine opening of the eyes. Their eyes were opened and they recognised him. Well, yes, indeed, right again. What a day, friends, and what an experience. And perhaps Perhaps it's, it's one of those occasions when we wish we could have been there ourselves. And that's, a, that's an understanding, understandable thought. Yet, you know, dwell on this. In a real sense, we can be there ourselves. And that's the beauty of what we're considering this afternoon. We can be there ourselves. Not literally, of course. That was then, and this is now. That was there, and this is here. Not literally. But as we study carefully the gospel passage, which was read to us earlier in our hearing, and also some of the verses which follow on from where we ended our reading. Now, we're going to consider things this afternoon in terms of a nourishing three-course meal. That's something that we uh, don't easily say no to, isn't it? A nourishing three-course meal. So we'll begin with the starter. 
and then we shall proceed to the mains and then we surely will have room after that for something by way of a dessert and we shall find that it all adds up to an Old Testament focus from a New Testament event. So here we go. First of all, brethren and friends, the starter, the starter. And turning together to this passage in Luke's Gospel in chapter 24, the starter is found in verse 15. And that beautiful, beautiful statement, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Isn't that lovely? Jesus himself drew near and went with them. That is, without doubt, I say to you, the place to start. Rather than skipping the starter, as we might occasionally do in a restaurant, particularly if there are big portions people, rather than skipping the starter and going straight onto the main course. We don't want to skip the start there. We don't want to skip the starter. Not easy to say. You don't want to skip the starter because the starter gives us the vital clue for our glorious subject. Question for you. In what manner did Jesus draw near to these two and join them on their journey? Answer, he did so in three ways. We can just state them. He drew near to them in person on the road. He drew near to them in fellowship, in the home, once they reached Emmaus. And he drew near to them in scripture, in their hearts. And it's that third note that as the Lord Jesus himself drew near and went with them, that he drew near to them in scripture and ministered to their hearts. That's what gives us our launch pad to consider the gospel on the Emmaus Road. And in a sense, uh, we were reminded earlier of, of where this fitted uh, this afternoon's uh, ministry, where it fitted in the, in the series. It was bringing up the rear quite appropriately in terms of the, the sequence. And, and really, all the previous lectures, the previous ministries, were leading to this point. That's why we're thankful that we can at least, albeit in a delayed fashion, reach this point now, rather than leave the thing hanging at the end of the previous episode, when things were somewhat incomplete. So this gathers up everything which, whether you were here or not, was delivered in the fullness of the series, the fullness of the series. And, and it's this great subject, speaking personally, it's one of my absolute favorites when we come to subjects. It's this subject of Christ in all the scriptures, or indeed, as in the title of David Murray's book just intimated, Jesus on every page. And I ask you, friends, is there a more wonderful, tasty, appetizing subject to consider than that? Christ in all the scriptures, Jesus on every page. So that's the starter, just to get us going, get the juices flowing. But now let's come on to the substance of the matter under our second division, the mains the mains. And here, two verses are absolutely crucial. One in our reading, one just a little beyond it. And in each case, it's the Lord Jesus Christ himself who is speaking. Observe verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And then observe verse 44, by which time 
The scene is not Emmaus, but Jerusalem. The Emmaus disciples have returned to Jerusalem and joined with the other disciples, and the risen Lord Jesus has now appeared to them in another of his resurrection appearances, and he has had something to eat. And he says to them in verse 44, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms, concerning me, to which we might just add, then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So this is the key to our main course. But immediately we just need to pause, to take a breath, and to make a fundamental and vital observation. It's this, these two verses that I'm calling your attention to for the mains, 27 and 44. What do they add up to? What do they add up to? Surely they add up to the entire Old Testament. That's what they do. The entire Old Testament. You remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in a very famous verse pertinent to our subject, John 5 and 39. He says, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Lord Jesus Christ didn't have a complete Bible that we have. His Bible, if we can put it that way reverently, was uh, the Old Testament. And so he's saying, and this is, this is why we're on the right lines and uh, nobody can have us for it. Here's the assurance that we're on the right lines with Christ in all the scriptures, and particularly today Christ in the Old Testament, because speaking of said scriptures, said Old Testament, he says... He says, they are they which testify of me. One of Alec Mateer's lovely books is just a little one, but it's a beauty, as all his books are for that matter, but not least this one, and it's got the lovely title, Loving the Old Testament. And I give you two quotes from it. Number one, the Old Testament is Jesus' Bible, and our devotion to it is part of our longing to be like him. And number two, without the Old Testament, we could not know Jesus properly. That's a challenge, isn't it? Not least to even occasionally well-meaning Christians who seem to reckon that the Bible begins with the Gospel of Matthew. Or that we needn't really be, be that interested, because that was such long, a long ago, as if it was a different God and a different people and a different Gospel. But no, 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 one God. One Bible, one gospel, one way of salvation. It's all one. We speak of the Old Testament and the New Testament, and, and, and that's helpful to us in finding our way around. But, but there aren't really two parts to the Bible, not as such. We have one Bible. We have one single word of God. And that's why. Alec Matea can say things like, without the Old Testament, we could not know Jesus properly. You say, but we, surely we know everything we want to know or could know about him in the New Testament. Wrong. Wrong. We need the Old Testament as well. Or, why would we have been given it? The Lord Jesus says, these are the scriptures. They testify of me. So never forget this that the entire Bible is focused upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He's there in the very first verse of it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that's a statement of the triune God. One God in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So there is Jesus in Genesis 1.1. And then as you go right to the other end, to Revelation 22.21, What's the last thing that we read in the Bible? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And so there he is in the first verse and in the last verse. 
and all the way through in between. What a wonderful way for the scripture of truth to commence with in Genesis and to conclude with in Revelation. And that should not surprise us. And so our prayer there should be, in that not least, is, is why I chose this hymn for our singing. Oh, may these heavenly pages be my ever dear delight, and still new beauties may I see in still increasing light. Divine instructor, gracious Lord, be thou forever near, especially this, friends, especially this, teach me to love thy sacred word and view my Saviour there. We view him just as much in the Old Testament as we do in the New. Now these two verses, 27 and 44, I say they speak of the entire Old Testament and what we call the Old Testament in its Hebrew scriptures is divided into three parts, uh, not altogether in the order of the books that we have in our English Bibles. It's divided into three parts, the law, the prophets, and the writings. Hebrew calls them Torah, Nevi'im, Ukathuvim. The law, the prophets, and the writings. And all these three departments, which together comprise our Old Testament, they add up to the all the scriptures that Jesus mentions in verse 27. Remember? He expounded unto them in all the scriptures, in the law, the prophets, and in the writings, in the Old Testament in its glorious fullness. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So let's take a little look together at each of these three departments in turn. Let's stop by for a moment or two, first of all, with the law. Verse 27, and beginning at Moses. Verse 44, all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses. In other words, the reference, of course, is to the Pentateuch. The first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers, or rather Numbers and Deuteronomy. These pillars, these foundation books of Scripture are all abounding and overflowing with the Lord Jesus Christ. And a very brief survey will have to suffice. In Genesis, think of this, the gospel concerning Jesus in Genesis. He's the seed of the woman who bruised the serpent's head. Chapter 3. He's seen in the type. You know what we mean by a type, don't you? A gospel type, a picture, if you will. He's seen in the type of the skins. Do you remember them? The skins with which God graciously clothed Adam and Eve after the fall. And what a, what a glorious gospel picture the skins are. And they remind us of that line that we sing sometimes, clothed in his righteousness alone. That ultimately, in gospel terms, is what the skins are all about. That's why we can expect to see Adam and Eve in heaven. Not everybody reckons we will. I'm rooting for it myself, because they had the skins. They had the skins. They had the divine covering. They had the clothing. So why would they not be there? He's seen, again by way of a type, in the ark that Noah built, chapter 6, in the rainbow of chapter 9, the glorious sign of God's covenant, mercy, grace, and love. There he is in Melchizedek, the priest king of chapter 14. There he is in the great 22nd chapter and that solemn business of Abraham sacrificing Isaac. Do you remember on Mount Moriah. The Lord Jesus Christ is there. How do we know he's there? He tells us. Where does he tell us? John 8, 58. Abraham saw my day and he was glad. And that's a reference.
to the teaching about the death, substitutionary, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Genesis, Abraham saw Christ's day and he was glad and it's spoken of again in the great 11th of Hebrews. The Lord Jesus Christ is there in the, the dream of Jacob at Bethel, the, the ladder, or we might even better render it the, uh, the, the stairway. Not so much a, a ladder like this, but more a, a stairway like that. But uh, comes to the same thing either way because it, uh, it, it, it touched earth and it entered into heaven, reminding us that the one way in which we can go from earth, sinners, to heaven, redeemed, is through the Lord Jesus Christ. He's there in the same Jacob's wrestling at Peniel. With whom did he wrestle? That was what we call a theophany, or a Christophany, by which we mean an appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ prior to his incarnation, when he came into the world as the Word made flesh. It was the Lord Jesus Christ who was having vital dealings in the wrestling at Peniel. We see the Lord Jesus Christ again and again, all the way through Joseph. Can't miss it. Can't miss it. In 37 following. And then there's a beauty which again we mustn't miss. In chapter 49, we see Jesus in Shiloh, to whom tribute comes, who bears the scepter and the ruler's staff, and to whom will be the gathering of the people. Well, let's move on to Exodus. And we've had reference made to Henry Law's book. The Gospel in Exodus brings out these things. Again, much of it is by type, but uh, that doesn't make it any less real. We're just thankful for the types. There he is in the Passover lamb of Exodus, unblemished, chapter 12. In Moses' intercession, 17. In all the priesthood and sacrificial system that runs throughout the book and, and how this is developed in Hebrews, isn't it? Then endless priests, endless sacrifices. They never sat down because there was always something to do, it's stated. But the Lord Jesus Christ, the one priest, great high priest, the one sacrifice of himself once offered, what did he do when he returned to heaven to the right hand of the majesty on high? We're told he sat down because he cried on the cross, Tetelestai, it is finished. It was done. We sing again sometimes maybe, finished all the types and shadows of the ceremonial law. And we find those types and shadows in a book like Exodus, as well as elsewhere in the Pentateuch, pointing us to the Lord Jesus Christ and his coming and all that's involved in his person and work. Or what do we make of Leviticus? Well, there's a, a great classic, not least in the 16th of Leviticus, the scapegoat and the day of atonement. Numbers. Don't overlook numbers. See the Lord Jesus there, especially in the brazen or the bronze serpent of chapter 21. And in a grand verse, 24, 17 of Numbers, the star coming out of Jacob and the scepter rising out of Israel. And then Deuteronomy, where the key one is the prophet like Moses from among the people to whom the people were to listen in chapter 18. And you remember the voice of the Father from heaven at Jesus' baptism and at Jesus' transfiguration. This is my Son, my beloved, the one I love. Listen to him. Hear him. Jesus, our prophet, as well as our priest, and as well as our king. And sadly, we don't hear so much or make so much these days as our, fa as our forefathers did in the faith, of the offices of Christ, prophet, priest, and king. But they're wonderful, they're glorious, they're so important, and they all have their root in the law. So all of this, and 
Surely much more just from the first five books of the Bible. And surely these will have been some of the things which Jesus opened up to the disciples when beginning at Moses. He spoke of those things concerning himself. But we said the law, the prophets and the writings, didn't we? So a moment or two now with the prophets. Verse 27, Moses and all the prophets. And you notice that, all the prophets, not some of the prophets, not just the ones where it's obvious, but all the prophets, every word counts. And then in 44 again, and the prophets. The so-called major ones, not because they were more important, but just because their books are bigger, weightier, longer. And all the minor ones, again, which isn't derogatory, but because their books, of course, are slimmer. And so on. But all equally, the prophets speaking the prophetic word. All the prophets. The message of the prophets. Very different men ministering very different times and in very different places, but they were all continually focused upon the Lord Jesus Christ. They were all, in our biblical order, from Isaiah the first of them to Malachi the last, they were all gospel men. They all looked forward themselves and they all pointed others forward to the Messiah who would come in the fullness of time. So, with seat belts tightly fastened, this at pace whip through all the prophets to see the gospel of Jesus therein. And again, this is just selective. The Lord Jesus Christ is Jeremiah's the Lord our righteousness, Jehovah Tzithkenu, the branch of the Lord. He is the fulfillment of Ezekiel's vision of the temple in whom is seen the glory of God. He is the stone that struck the image and became a great mountain that covered the earth, the one like the Son of God in the fiery furnace, and the one like a Son of Man who came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, all in the book of Daniel. He is the faithful and true husband in Hosea, the focus of the day of the Lord in Joel. He is Amos's restorer of the people, Obadiah's judge and saviour, in whom we, lovely phrase in that prophecy, in whom we possess our possessions. He is, again, glorious type here, he is very much there typologically, in Jonah and his experience uh, with the fish, the great fish, not a mention of a whale anywhere, great fish is what it's described. Maybe it was a whale, maybe it wasn't, but great fish, we're happy with that. A type of the death, the resurrection, the death, the burial, we should say, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, to which Jesus himself makes very clear reference in the Gospels and adds of himself, a greater than Jonah is here. The Lord Jesus Christ is Micah's shepherd ruler from Bethlehem. He is the one who is a stronghold in the day of trouble and who knows those who take refuge in him, according to Nahum. He is our salvation in and through whom we live by faith, says Habakkuk. He's the one on whose account Jehovah rejoices over us with gladness and quiets us with his love in Zephaniah. He is Haggai's signet ring. He's the king, humble and mounted on a donkey, the priest upon his throne, the one who was pierced and through whom sinners are cleansed from sin and uncleanness, according to Zechariah. And he's Malachi's messenger of the covenant, who is like a refiner's fire and will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, where he's also the son of righteousness, who rises with healing in his wings. Enough to be going on with, friends. And what about 
One we haven't mentioned, not because we've forgotten him, we've got him now. What about the one who appears first among the Old Testament prophets in the order that we have them in our Bibles? Of course, Isaiah. What of Isaiah? Years ago, someone wrote a catechism for children, and it included this perhaps rather unusual question for a catechism. Who was the prophet Isaiah? That's the question. You know a catechism, it has a question, it gives an answer. Who is the prophet Isaiah? That was the question. Answer, Isaiah is that prophet who spoke most of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so say all of us, don't we? So he did. What an abundant wealth of Jesus and the gospel awaits us in Isaiah. And again, as part of our main course, we can only just mention one or two beauties. In chapter 7, 14, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. It had a historical reference, but it's taken directly in the Gospels, isn't it, to refer to the Lord Jesus Christ. The very beautiful 9-6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. We don't want the comma between those two words. It doesn't belong. They're each pairs. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He's there in chapter 11 and verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Leaping over to chapter 42, he's there very beautifully in 42, as soon as we get to it, here it comes, chapter 42. Speaking of, well, with too far there, friends got into Jeremiah 42, thought it wasn't what I was after. But here we are, Isaiah 42, Behold my servant, Father speaking, Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Remember we have in John's Gospel that upon the Lord Jesus there dwells the spirit without measure. We as Christians have the spirit with measure, in measure, he without measure. And then this beauty, again, Quoted in the Gospels, a bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. Where do we begin or end with the end of Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53? One of the wonderful, wonderful statements in Isaiah 53 is, is this, and it's sometimes overlooked. It's in verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is done, so he openeth not his mouth. You have there sometime, something which we see so clearly in the Gospels, don't we? When the Lord Jesus Christ is being dragged from pillar to post, at various trials that he was subjected to between his arrest and his crucifixion. Sometimes he gave an answer when it suited him. At other times we have the very thing spoken of here. We might call it the silence of the Lamb. He opened not his mouth. Chapter 61 is very fruitful. He's speaking of himself here, and you remember he takes this as his text concerning himself in the synagogue in Nazareth in Luke 4. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, uh, the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. We've got to read another verse because it's so exquisite. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, 
the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. He's there in Isaiah 63, verse 3. I have trodden the winepress alone. Remember how on the cross he was bereft in the hours of darkness, hence him taking Psalm 22, verse 1 upon his lips, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In those hours of darkness, can you imagine it? The second person of the Godhead bereft for a season of the comfort and joy and fellowship of the first and the third persons of the Godhead. We might say, how could such a thing ever be? But so it was. I have trodden the winepress alone. None was with me. It's very lovely. And again, those are just hints, tasters from Isaiah. Are you still with me? We've had a root around in the law and a root around in the prophets, but that leaves for us the third department, if you will, of the Hebrew Old Testament, the writings. And these are those summarized in verse 44 as the Psalms. The reference to the Psalms there, I put it to you, means more than just the book of Psalms. It rather refers to this entire section called the writings, which as well as the Psalms, sometimes just summed up as the Psalms, but in reality, as well as the Psalms, cover Proverbs, Job, Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. Interestingly, in the Hebrew Bible, uh, the writings also include Daniel, though we've included him for our purposes this afternoon amongst the prophets. Let me mention then, as representative of this vast corpus known as the writings, let me mention the Psalms and one other, one other. First of all, the Psalms. Again, just representative. The Lord Jesus Christ is the exalted King, Psalm 2. The dying Saviour, Psalm 22. The loving Shepherd, Psalm 23. The ascended King, Psalm 24. Oh, that glorious passage at the end of Psalm 24, from verse 7, you know, about the, 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 the gates and the doors opening up. What for? To let the King of glory in. Got to sing it to St. George's Edinburgh in the metrical. Nothing else will do. St. George's Edinburgh. And once you get a hang of it, perhaps it's a regular here, I don't know. But once you get a hang of St. George's Edinburgh, oh, you'll begin to live where psalm singing is concerned. So he's the ascended king of Psalm 24, the royal bridegroom of Psalm 45, of which a further mention in a minute. He's the coming or returning judge, Psalm 96. He's the mighty God, Psalm 110. He's the risen Lord, Psalm 118. And remember that the, the Psalter, the Psalter from which we, we sang at the beginning of the service with the 93rd, remember that the the Psalter was also Jesus' hymn book, Jesus' praise book. And uh, David Murray, our friend here with Jesus on every page, he treats this delightfully in, in chapter 16 of the book, in the chapter entitled Christ's Poets. And he writes this so well, <clears throat> I'd like to just give you a taster. He says this, we may worship Jesus in the Psalms by meditating on when and how he sang them. How we wish we could have heard him praise his heavenly Father with psalms of praise. How mournfully he sang the psalms of lament as he saw the impact of sin on himself, the church and the community. How anxiously he sang the psalms of suffering as he anticipated the sacrificial pains that lay ahead for him. How joyfully he sang the psalms of thanksgiving for the many deliverances he experienced. How boldly he sang the psalms of confidence 
as he entrusted himself to his heavenly father. How gladly he sang the Psalms of Remembrance as he recalled God's great acts in the past. How soberly he sang the Psalms of Suffering. How powerfully he sang the royal psalms. How holily he sang the imprecatory psalms. When he saw the spiritual devastation his enemies were causing. That's one paragraph and he immediately follows it up with this. Just to give ear to this one as well. Just as certain psalms seem to especially fit certain seasons of our lives. And they do, don't they? Because the, the book of Psalms for us as believers is very much a, a handbook of, of spiritual experience, Christian experience, all spiritual experience, all Christian experience, all of the believer's experience is there somewhere or other in the Psalms. And so Murray says, just as certain Psalms seem to especially fit certain seasons of our lives, so the Psalms fitted the many stages of Jesus' life. When he was a young boy, when he was a teenager, when he went to the synagogue, when he was carrying out his morning devotions, when he read the scriptures, when he reflected on his preaching, when he defeated temptation, when he woke, when he slept, when he watched the devil at work, when he saw souls saved, when he heard of the deaths of his followers, when he celebrated the Passover with his unique and unparalleled understanding, when the cross loomed, when he was falsely accused, when he was betrayed, when he was forsaken, and when he was dying, then rising again. And all these things that he mentioned, that I've read to you from both paragraphs, he backs them all up in the notes at the back of the book with scripture proofs. Lest you thought it was all a bit far-fetched. Not far-fetched at all. So I said, as representative of the writings, we say something about the Psalms and one other, which... One other. Well, some of you here know me pretty well, so uh, there's only one other, isn't there, that uh, we're going to slip in this afternoon. And that, of course, is the Song of Songs. Uh, the Song of Songs. Where we see the Lord Jesus Christ, we might say, at his most beautiful. At his most beautiful. He's the apple tree amongst the trees of the forest. He's the lily of the valley. He's the rose of Sharon. He's the fairest of 10,000. He is the one who is altogether lovely, or strictly in the Hebrew, plural. He is altogether lovelinesses. Again, a, a tricky word, but it, it, it shows you know, that, that his, his loveliness is a, well, if this makes sense to you, it's a plural matter. There's so much to it. He is so lovely. He's not just lovely, that's it, but all his lovelinesses. And, uh, and so on. This, this, this book, the whole reason, uh, uh, many, many dispute this, but uh, sadly they're wrong. Uh, well, well, thankfully they're wrong, we might say. Uh, thankfully they're wrong. Uh, many dispute this, and they think that the, uh, uh, the Song of Songs is in for, for other human reasons and so on. And there is help in, in terms of human relationships there. Of course there is. But that's not the reason why it's in the canon of Scripture. The reason why it's here in our Bibles is to tell us about the marriage relationship between Christ and the church, that's the corporate sense, Christ and the believer, that's the individual sense. The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, Christ who loved the church and gave herself for it. Remember that key verse that I gave you at the beginning, John 5, 39. These are the scriptures that testify of me. So is somehow the Song of Songs to be the exception? Or verse 27, in our chapter, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures. Did he miss out the Song of Songs? Did he mean all the scriptures, but, but uh, apart from the Song of Songs? No. In a sense, the Song of Songs is fuller of the Lord Jesus Christ, despite only its eight chapters, than any other Old Testament book. Mentioned with regard to the Psalms a moment ago, that the Lord Jesus is the royal bridegroom of Psalm 45. And I've often felt and uh, endlessly have said that Psalm 45 is really the song of songs in miniature. That's what it is. If you read Psalm 45 and then the song, or you read the song and then Psalm 45, you'll really find that Psalm 45, my heart is, is indicting a good matter, it's really the song of songs 
in miniature. And I've got this lovely quote for you from Spurgeon. He is speaking of Psalm 45, which I've just described to you as the Song of Songs in Miniature. But what he says about the 45th Psalm, he could just as well say, and uh, I am saying uh, this afternoon, about the Song of Songs. This is Spurgeon. Some see here Solomon and Pharaoh's daughter only. They are short-sighted. Others see both Solomon and Christ. They are cross-eyed. Well-focused spiritual eyes see Jesus only, or he's willing to grant this to tender souls, or if Solomon be present at all, it must be like those hazy shadows of passers-by which cross the face of the camera and therefore are dimly traceable upon a photographic landscape. And some say, ah, the Song of Songs, it can't be about Jesus because it's not quoted in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. Not every Bible book in the Old Testament necessarily is quoted in the New Testament. But Psalm 45 is quoted in the New Testament and applied to the Lord Jesus Christ. So there I rest my case that the Song of Songs is all about the Lord Jesus Christ and how thankful we are that it is so and we would not be without it. So then, we've been considering for our mains the Lord Jesus Christ expounding to them in all the scriptures the entirety of the, the Old Testament. We may not, and of course we do not, possess Jesus' actual detailed exposition from that blessed journey to Emmaus. But we do have his text, and his text is the entire Old Testament. And his three points, if you like, as sermons often have three, but I've known some have as many as 15 or 27 or something, at least in the dear old Puritan days. We know his text, the entire Old Testament, and we know his three main points, his three main divisions the law, the prophets, and the writings. Our business, dear friends, is to study humbly and prayerfully the Old Testament, asking the Holy Spirit, as Jesus in John 16 in the upper room said he will, asking the Holy Spirit to take what is of the Lord Jesus Christ, to declare it to us. Remember Jesus says there, he shall glorify me. And it's a lovely thing when the, when the Holy Spirit glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ as he bring, brings to us from the Scriptures, and, and not least in this afternoon's context, from the Old Testament, all the precious and lovely things of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you remember that although the Holy Spirit is himself God, third person of the Godhead, yet it's his particular delight not to draw attention to himself, which he rightfully could, but rather to deflect attention from himself in order to focus it entirely upon the second person, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we've had our starter and we've had our mains. Have you any room left for some dessert? Sometimes if we've had a starter, we wonder, don't we? Some people skip the starter in order to have the dessert, but we want a balanced three course meal this afternoon, don't we? So we've had the starter, we've had the mains, and we'll round off with a little dessert. And our concern with this course of our meal is to ask and to answer this exceedingly important question. Namely, what effect should our consideration of Christ and so of the Gospel in the Old Testament scriptures have upon us? Should it leave us cold? Should it find us unmoved? Should it make us wish we hadn't started and hadn't bothered and had done something else instead? Perish the very thought. Here is the beloved Son of the Father who became obedient unto death, 
even the death of the cross for our sakes, for our sins, for our salvation, to put us right with God, rose again from the dead, gives us the gift of eternal life. He, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever is alive. Forever. His is the power of an endless and indestructible life and he has opened heaven for us for that lovely time when, as Isaiah puts it, the ransomed of the Lord shall return to Zion with, with singing, with everlasting joy, sorrow, sighing, God. So here's the best beloved of our souls, the Lord Jesus. Here's our all-sufficient, all in all. We sing, don't we? Jesus, Jesus, all-sufficient, beyond telling is thy worth. So again I ask, what effect should a consideration of Christ and so the gospel in the Old Testament scriptures have upon us? Well, I say to you, it should leave us with a very strong case of spiritual pyrosis. Ever get that? Touch of the old spiritual pyrosis. Look it up in the dictionary and you'll find it's the technical medical name for heartburn. Heartburn. Do you ever suffer from physical pyrosis? In other words, do you ever get heartburn, perhaps from eating well-balanced three-course meals too fast? A very uncomfortable feeling. But what about spiritual pyrosis? What about spiritual heartburn? Oh, brethren and friends, nothing uncomfortable there. Hearts on fire. Thrilling, delighted, overwhelmed, and more of the same. Choose your own vocabulary. And so the final key verse in our, in our time this afternoon in Luke 24 is, of course, verse 32. By which time the happening in the Emmaus home has taken place. The Lord Jesus Christ has revealed himself to the disciples. Their eyes have been opened. Then he vanishes. And straight away, having just done a seven-miler from Jerusalem to Emmaus and have a, a brief stop for tea, so to speak, because they'd invited Jesus in, they think nothing of doing the journey straight back to Jerusalem in the other direction saying as they were there in the village and as they then romped back to, to Jerusalem, not being able to get there fast enough. Verse 32, and they said one to another, did not our hearts burn within us? They had spiritual pyrosis. They had spiritual heartburn. And what was the cause of it? Friends, what gave it to them? Read the whole verse. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? That's what it was, you see. It was the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ of himself to them from the Old Testament scriptures that gave them this not painful physical heartburn, but blessed spiritual heartburn. This is what made them so excited and this is why they had no weariness in going back to Jerusalem to tell everyone who had happened who what had happened and that Jesus was indeed risen and they had seen him oh what needs we all have friends for such a blessing oh that we had it every Lord's Day in the ministry of the word and in between Lord's Days in in private Bible reading in in any family worship that we're engaged in or or fellowship uh, in the word with with fellow believers. Oh, what need we have. We all need it and we all, may all have it. Uh, J.I. Packer here for us. The health-giving heartburn that they experienced was not unique to them. On the contrary, all those in every age to whom God's word is opened know it. What is it? It's a blend of clarity and joy in the presence of God that excites one for worship and work and witness. To which surely... We must respond, oh, for such excitement, oh, for such enthusiasm. If we're going to be excited and if we're going to be enthusiastic, may it be on the basis of spiritual heartburn, Christ in all the scriptures. And we're learning, or learning afresh maybe, just how and where to find it in the word of God. So, so rounding off 
We're almost gliding here from the dessert into, if you like, the coffee and the mints. You like a coffee and mint to finish off? One thing to round off with. What are some of what we might call the choicest marks of burning hearts? Spiritual pyrosis. A new penitence and shame for sin. A fervent gratitude for the grace of God. A fresh prizing of the Lord Jesus Christ. An enlivened sense of his love which passes knowledge. A more abundant delight in his company, a renewed beholding of his glory, a more fervent longing for when in heaven we shall be both with him and like him. And there's more, a deeper desire for a more, a more consistent Christian walk and a larger measure of holiness, a more glowing zeal for the advancing of Christ's cause, the proclaiming of his gospel, the blessing and building of his church, and the honouring of his name. A more tender concern, lest we grieve or offend him in any way, along with a genuine soreness of heart, that we have grieved him so very, very often before. An enlarged willingness, even if need be, to be hated by men in the service of our best of masters, and an increased passionate longing for Jesus' return, that our prayers in public and in private would increasingly be marked by the petition, Come, Lord Jesus. And this, one more thing, a new breath of the Holy Spirit upon us as we press on step by step to heaven, where we shall love the Lord Jesus Christ with unsinning hearts, sitting down at the marriage supper of the Lamb, discovering more than we'd ever realised or discovered before that there is, that there in his wonderful banqueting house, his banner over us is love. That, friends, that surely will be the everlasting fruit and the permanent high point of the gospel on the Emmaus Road. Amen. Amen.